four things. And if you notice, the last two things, tawasi bil haqq and tawasi bil sabr, are actually deeds in and of themselves. They are deeds. And so, amilu salihat is a deed, amal. And tawasi bil haqq and tawasi bil sabr are also a'mal, amalain. They're both actions too. In other words, what we're learning here is Allah highlighted the two actions. This is what I mentioned last time also. Allah is highlighting the two actions that get overlooked by people when they think about good deeds. The actions that they don't t- tend to think about when they think about doing good deeds are the ones that are explicitly highlighted. So we understand this is the bare minimum of good deeds that you need to accomplish. That is tawasi bil haq and tawasi bil sabr included in the discussion. Now, I want to share with you... Um, a scenario. And I, I, I really benefited from this scenario as my teacher Dr. Abdul Sami' in one dar he explained it. I also heard Dr. Sar Ahmed talk about it in detail. Uh, very, very I found it very beneficial. And we're gonna look at the lessons of Surah Al-Asr before we get into the tafsir of the surah itself from an overview, even from the point of view of a non-Muslim. We'll look at some of the lessons and the logical co- cohesion of the surah from the point of view of the non of a non-Muslim. Whenever you are brought a problem, a dispute some issue in life. Any decent human being, what is the first thing they will do? The first thing they will do, no matter what dispute is brought to them, is they would, they would demand and they would make efforts to get to the facts of the case. The first thing is to get the facts right. To get to the truth itself. You wouldn't just take it at face value, you would explore it. And it's the more serious the problem, the more serious your inquiry into getting to the truth. You would, you would have to exhaust yourself in getting to the facts of the matter. Okay. This is the, the very least requirement of not a believer, but of decency. A decent human being, a decent judge, you know, they would have to, maybe, for example, there's a dispute in your family. You know, there's a couple of members of your family that are fighting and they brought the issue to you. At the, you know, indecently, what you would do is you don't like one of your cousins, you like the other one, so you pass judgment. <laughs> against the one you don't like. But what does judgment or justice or decency require? That you look at the facts of the case. Okay. Now that you discover the truth, you actually, it's not enough that you found the truth, you have to now stand by that truth. You have to make a judgment, you have to take action in accordance with the truth that you found. It is possible that you find the truth and when you find it, you don't like what you found. And when you don't like what you found, your actions do not, don't represent your findings. So what you believe to be true isn't being reflected in your actions. What do we call that? Hypocrisy. That's nifaq, that's hypocrisy. But if you find something to be true, then it is part of human decency to stick to it, live by it, execute it, implement it, and that is the next necessary consequence. Now, that's one thing that you, you internalized it for yourself. That this is injustice and I'm not going to do it. I've discovered that this is a wrong act, I will not commit it. I will discover that this is what I must do and I will do it. Now when you see other people doing wrong, then you know the, the society in which we live, we have the MYOB policy, mind your own business policy, right? This is not the policy of the prophets. This is not the policy of the believers. In other words, if the prophets were to mind their own business, then salah and dhikr of Allah would be it. That would be it. You have Surah Al-Muzzammil, the Messenger is being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا نَصْفَهُ أَوْ إِنْقُسْ مِنْهُ قَلِيلًا أَوْ زِدْ عَلَيْهِ وَرَتِّ لِلْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Recite the Qur'an. Remember Allah. That's for Himself. But then there's another surah, right? There's Muzzammil and what else? مدث. يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِرْ قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ Go rise and warn. Warn who? Others. Tell them what you're doing is wrong. Now if you find something to be wrong, and when you see a wrong happening, it is human decency to say, that you should at least speak out against it. And say, you guys shouldn't do that. Now let me give you a, a, worldly, a real life scenario. You know that others people, other people's property should not be damaged. Right? People have the right that their property should be respected. You're walking down the street, and a couple of kids are playing baseball in the street, and they're hitting the ball really hard, and it's hitting other people's cars. Right? Now you know the truth already. The truth is they shouldn't be doing that. You wouldn't do that yourself. So you've done a good thing for yourself. You're not a criminal. Fine. But is that enough? Is that enough that you just walk by and you, the thought comes to your mind, maybe I should tell these guys this isn't a good thing. Maybe I should tell them they don't have a right to do that to other people. Maybe I should stand up for justice. But when you want to stand up for justice like that, you know some other thoughts come in your mind that stop you from doing that. What comes in your mind? 
And these guys might get together and beat me up. I might become the baseball, right? Instead of bashing the car, they might bash me up. So I better keep my mouth shut if I know what's good for me. I, I know it, I, it's wrong, I shouldn't do it, but I don't have the guts to tell them not to do it. You understand? I know it's right, I must do it, I don't have the guts to tell somebody else, I don't know if you should do that. At, le- at the very least to tell them. If you can't enforce it, at least to tell them. Now the thing is, a decent human being, a courageous human being, doesn't just stop themselves from doing wrong, what else do they do? They open their mouth about it. And you know what? Even kuffar do that. Even non-Muslims do that. Even mushrikun do that. Even when they believe, they believe for some, 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 uh, some of them believe for example, that you know, animals have a right not to be eaten or whatever. They don't just become vegetarians. What else do they do? Animal rights protests. Right? They, they go out and they speak their mind. First they convince themselves of something. Then they implement it on themselves. And then what do they do? They go out there and stand up for it. They'll even take a beating for it, might get sprayed in the face for it. And this is not even Muslims. But this process exists for those who commit to something. Where does it all come from? It all started from their belief. Their belief was really strong, and it was strong enough to change their behavior. It was strong enough to change their behavior, then it was strong enough to make them speak out about it. And it was when they spoke out about it, and they got tough times for it, they were willing to persevere. They were willing to just stick it out. No matter what, we're gonna do this thing. You know? So you have this, this idea of, you know, uh, uh, this progression that starts with conviction. It doesn't just happen with Islam, it happens with any ideology, by the way. Communists did this. You know, students in Tiananmen Square did this. The, the, the uh, Irani society did this when they revolted against the Shah. They did these, they, they believed something, they changed themselves, then they stood up for it, and they, they spoke out about it, and when persecution came, they, they were patient persevering. This is the, you know, even among non-Muslim history, you find this is the revolution of Gandhi or whatever, right? Same idea. It is the same logical progression. But now we're taking this human, you know, and by the way, every time this kind of struggle happens, from a non-Muslim, we're not even talking from an Islamic point of view. From a non-Muslim point of view, those people who do this, who follow this process, are called heroes in history. They call them heroes in history. Whoever followed this procedure. This, you know, whether it's Martin Luther King, whether it's God, whoever it may be, they are looked upon as people who accomplished great things because they stuck to their beliefs and they stood up for justice no matter what the cost, right? And they are, their days are celebrated and their books written about them, monuments made about them. All of this is done because human beings deep down inside, no matter what culture, what tradition they come from, this is the process of decency that they respect. But then to imagine that you're fighting for something that in and of itself is incomplete. Most human beings, that they, even great human beings that struggled, whose struggles are commendable, they ended up struggling for something that in and of itself may be true, but it's only a small part of the truth. It's not the whole truth. And what Allah gave to us is the entire truth. So if they are willing to be convinced of something that is a small part of the truth, can you imagine a comparison between any of those activists and a believer? How much more convinced they, the believer should be? And if they are willing to change themselves, how much more willing should a believer be to change himself? And if they are willing to speak out about it, how much more willing should a believer be? And if they are willing to stand up against oppression, and still stick to their beliefs, and stand up for them, and speak the truth no matter what the cost, how much more of a right does Allah have on the believer? Sometimes the kuffar become an man, they can stand like that and compete. In sabr, this is why Allah says to us at the end of Surah Ali Imran, He says, "Ya ayyuha ladina amanu, isbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu wa taqullah." Those of you who claim to believe have perseverance, then compete in perseverance. Meaning, your enemies also have sabr; they have beliefs, and they act out on those beliefs. And no matter how hard it gets, we must persevere. We must move forward. They have this idea, you should compete with them in sabr, and remain consistent. وَرَابِطُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And you have something they don't have. Your taqwa will give you strength. They don't have taqwa, they will not give them strength. You will be able to beat them in this competition of sabr and perseverance. SubhanAllah. So, this, is, this was the overview that I wanted to share with you before we got into the tafsir of the surah itself. Now we begin with Ibn Ta'ala. First we begin with the ayah wal asr. We already talked about the oath and its benefits. So we'll look at some of the opinions of the salaf, including the sahaba. We begin with Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says it refers to the ages, meaning different uh, ages of different nations. 
and the decades and centuries that have passed in human existence. In other words, when we said Allah is talking about all of human history as proof that human beings are in loss, even today, that's what Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu is saying in a nutshell. Ibn Kisan says al-asr refers to the night and the day. In other words, the human being should look at the nightfall and the daybreak and say, I am in loss. His, his, the state of emergency should be awakened every time the believer sees nightfall and every time he sees or she sees daybreak. Subhanallah. So we know it's easy to say, they said this and you move on. But when they said that, what is the consequence of that? What happens to our understanding of Qur'an and the way we look at the night and the day and the way we think about time? These are transformational things. You know, sometimes you find the salaf, they have, their tafsir is one word, two words. A whole ayah, their tafsir is one word. But if you think about that word, man... <laughs> you realize how deep these people are, subhanAllah. They say a lot by saying a little. It takes us a lot more to say a little, but they say a little, but they end up saying a lot in, that, in those few words. They have these, this, this eloquence to them. Then, uh, similar, Hassan al-Basri says, this is from late day to sunset. This is the span from late, I mean, begin, beginning of Asr all the way to sunset, which is what I told you in ancient times, this was the time when there's a lot of hustle and bustle and emergency. Also it illustrates the end of an era. Meaning a day is like an era, it's the end of an era. So what that implies as far as the human being is concerned is, know that your life is basically on the verge of death. Know that you are on the verge, on the very edge of the end of your life. Just like the sun is about to run out and darkness is about to fall, this life of your world, your worldly life is about to run out, and the, not, the death of it is about to fall upon you. Think of it like that, and then you, you will develop that state of emergency. Qatada says it's the last part of the day, radiallahu anhu. Maqatil and Zamakhshari both actually commented, this is Salat al-Asr. Their interpretation of what Asr was, Salat al-Asr. And this is part of the, the methodology of tafsir that says that when Allah swears by something, it must be something sacred. Right? That's one of the opinions about oaths. So in line with that methodology, they are saying, because Salat al-Asr is sacred, and how is it sacred? Allah calls it, أَقِمِسْ you know, حَافِذُوا عَلَى صَلَوَاتِكُمْ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوَسْطَى Right? You know, guard your prayers, especially the middle prayer. And what's the middle prayer? Al Asr, right? Surah Al Asr. That's so Allah especially makes a point to talk about the Asr prayer and why the Asr prayer. Again, tied to what society was doing at that time. They're they're really really busy at what time? Asr. That's when their meeting is. That's when the project is due. Then when the store is most busy. When the store is most busy, that's the hardest time to leave and make salah, isn't it? When the project, when the meeting is going on. Between exactly the times of that's the that's the time for them when they have to break away from their daily activities and go and make the salah. So Allah swears by that, and the fact that they're not able to do that, they are in loss. Subhanallah. Uh, then uh, in Abu Al Bayan, we find actually first we'll go to Aisha Al Tafasir. It says Al Dahru Kulluhu. Al Asr refers to time, all of it. And when we get to uh, linguistic analysis, we'll see the difference between the word Dahr and the word Asr. In Surah Al Insan, Allah says Ata Al Insani Hinun Min Al Dahri. So the word dahar is used. Here the word asr is used. So we'll understand the difference between these two words. But anyway, Aisha al-Tafasir says, الدهر كله. أضواء البيان says, الزمن كله أو جزء منه. It is all time or a portion of time. And because of that portion of time, some Mufassirun even said, al-asr here is referring to the life of the Prophet wasallam, And they interpreted this because in another place in the Qur'an, Allah swears by the age of the Prophet. La umruka. He swears by the lifespan of the Prophet ﷺ. So they inferred from that that Allah says, وَالْعَصْرِ is referring to the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. In other words, the life of the last messenger that is being sent to all humanity, if they don't listen to him, they are definitely in loss. You see the connection? Because this is the dawn of, or this is the, pretty much the sunset of the...